Hey guys, this is your last topic for Edexcel GCSE Biology, all about ecosystems and things that live in them. Fantastic, fantastic topic here, and it deserves a fantastic video. An ecosystem are the animals, plants, everything living within a certain area. The community are the plants and animals that live there. And they're all dependent upon one another. They cannot survive without each other. For example, the animals eat the plants. They can't survive without doing that. And the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds. To survive and reproduce, a species needs food, water, air, and sometimes, but not always, a mate. Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors such as light intensity, temperature, water levels, pH, Iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels, and oxygen levels. Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators, and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, um, say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much um, area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered. You start at a point, take a line and then take measurements at every single point along that line. Um, this could be, say, from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. All food chains start in the same place with the sun providing energy. And then from this energy, things are going to grow, mainly plants, and they get eaten by other things. Whether it's um, grass being eaten by cows and then going on to be eaten by us, or whether we eat the plants directly, or whether the plants hear the corn is being turned into corn syrup, which is used in ketchup. Whether we eat them directly or process them, we are a top consumer. Whereas other things like cows are going to be herbivores because they just eat plants. The direction of the arrow is really important in food chains. The direction of the arrow means eaten by. When we are looking at food chains, we can also think about constructing pyramids, either pyramids of numbers or pyramids of biomass. Each of these are trophic levels, and when we're doing numbers, you just need to look at the number of things that eat the thing below it. And biomass, we need to take into account the number and the mass of the stuff that's being eaten. As we jump between trophic levels, roughly 10% of energy is transferred from one to the other. It is going to be lost in a number of different ways. Respiration. Waste, as in um, urea and faeces. 
movement, running around, jumping, doing normal animal things. Biodiversity is the range of plants and animals that live within a habitat. And humans have a massive impact on biodiversity, whether it is chopping down loads of natural fields so that we can plant the same type of crop over and over again, reducing the biodiversity in that environment because we're replacing it with the same type of crop, or whether we are chopping down fields, forests, so that we can replace it with cities. Food security is how sure that we are going to have food on our table. So how are we sure we are that our supermarkets are going to be full of things for us to buy? If as a country we don't produce much of our own food, we have to buy it in from other places. Which means we depend on other countries, other people's climates, trade agreements with these other countries and transport arrangements, getting the food across borders. Increasing our own food production in this country will ensure our food or help to ensure our food security. If we are producing our own food, we're not reliant on other people. We need to take into account ways to increase yields, for example, using fertilizer, but then we also need to take into account the impact that will have on the wider environment. And we need to take into account production methods. Are they land intensive? Are they good for the environment or not? As we are on an island, sustainable fishing is one way we can help to secure our food security. But we need to take into account things like net size. Are we catching fish before they are too old, before they've had a chance to reproduce? Are we catching too many? Do we maybe need to move to lion caught fish so we don't catch endangered species? And we need to look at fisheries quotas. We can also look at new ways of developing food, for example, culturing microorganisms, which we can use as a food source. Microorganisms are part of the system of biotics and abiotic factors that help break down old things, for example, old food, so that the components can be recycled back through the system. Decay and decomposition are breaking down of organic matter, and this generally happens by microorganisms. And microorganisms are alive, and this is what we need to think about when we are looking at how temperature, water and oxygen affect the levels of decay. They are not going to work at very, very low temperatures. They are going to have a rather narrow set of temperatures which they are going to want to work in. They rely on enzymes to break things down. They are going to slowly be increasing their, um, how, how well they work as the temperature increases. But then at a certain point the enzymes are going to nature so it's going to come quite steeply down. And if it gets too hot the whole thing is going to catch on fire. Very similar with the level of water, it's going to be slowly increasing as it gets uh, wetter and then past a certain point the bacteria just aren't going to be able to cope. They need to have oxygen, they need to be able to respire and if there's too much water they just can't do that. Oxygen, there is a very narrow amount of oxygen that they will be able to use. Um, without oxygen they can't do anything and too much oxygen then it starts to become toxic. In the garden, gardeners can compost things so that they can get rid of their um, unwanted things and then take the nutrients, the goodies in there and put them back onto the garden. Compost is going to get rather hot as this goes on and it's going to get rather smelly and gas is going to be released and this gas can be harvested and used. So for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds and if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air and the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air 
it can be taken up by plants and this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals. And then plants and animals both die. From the um, organic compounds that are in the dead um, plants and animals, they can turn into fossil fuels by either either being buried or being sedimented or they can just go straight back up into the air by the process of decay. And then lastly our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing, it is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals and then being inserted into fossil fuels which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years and you need to know all of these steps. The water cycle is much more complicated than you think it is going to be. Heat energy from the sun comes down, warms the surface of the water on the earth and this is going to cause the water to evaporate. As the water evaporates, it's going to become less dense, it's going to rise up, and then it's going to condense when it starts to cool down. This is when we're going to get clouds formed. When the clouds are heavy, when the water has accumulated so much, it is going to start to rain, and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. After it's rained, the water is going to do a number of things. It can go into the mountains where it will sink in or percolate. Deep into the mountains where it's then going to pick up stuff like irons, salts, um, which is going to affect the, the taste and the chemistry of the water. This will then come out somewhere as a little stream and go into the river. Some of it's going to go into the soil, moving slowly back towards um, a river or a lake as through flow. Some of the water will go straight onto the ground. If the rock or the mud is already saturated, if it is full of water or the rock is impermeable, then that will just run off into the nearest river or stream or lake or reservoir. All of it ending up at some point in a large collection of water, whether that is in the sea again or whether that's in a reservoir or whether that's in a lake. Some of that water will get taken up by plants and used in photosynthesis. It will also come out of plants in a process of transpiration. And then go up into make clouds and then the cycle can start all over again. The air is about 78% nitrogen but it is really really unreactive so getting it to do anything is tricky. We need to convert the nitrogen into nitrates this can happen by lightning 
by the Harbour process, which we'll cover in chemistry. The Harbour process is used to make fertilisers, which are then put on the ground by nitrifying bacteria. And these nitrifying bacteria are going to be in the root nodules of legumes. So peas, sweet peas we have here, peanuts, stuff like that. These plants then get eaten by animals. The animals can then release the nitrogen compounds in either urine or feces, poo. And eventually, death as well. We're then going to have denitrifying bacteria, which will take the nitrate compounds which are in the soil from the urine, the poo or the death, turn it back into nitrogen gas and release it into the air.